I'm, uh, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Bernie Kilkelly, president of the Neary New York chapter this year. Pleased to have uh, so many of our uh, board members here with us tonight. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll stick around after the program and get to meet a lot of them. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of our members here and uh, hopefully some non-members who will become members after this. Uh, and we're very pleased to be here at NYU. I want to thank uh, the NYU Stern School for hosting us tonight. And we're looking forward to a great program with uh, Professor Baruch Lev, who is no stranger to Neary, has done uh, you know, many programs with our uh, group over the years uh, here in New York and I believe at other uh, chapters. And moderating the event tonight, we're pleased to have Gene uh, Epstein of Barron's, uh, who's been the economics editor there for many years. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gene. Thank you. Well, as a uh, journalist, uh, I'm honor bound to give you uh, full disclosure at the outset. Uh, we journalists not only want to avoid impropriety, but the appearance of impropriety. I'm going to be unable to avoid the appearance of impropriety since I consider Baruch a, f a good friend. I've known him for a number of years, although before meeting him, I did uh, read and was very impressed by his 2001 book, Intangibles, Management, Measurement, and Reporting. His writing on intangible capital is fascinating and stimulating. I wrote about it in Barron's, and then I met Baruch and got to know him. I uh, also uh, helped uh, consult a bit on his manuscript and acknowledges me kindly in the book. I was asked to give my opinion of the book, and uh, at the back, you can read it, a couple of key sentences. There has never been a shortage of gurus, wise and otherwise, who presume to advise corporate executives on how to manage their company's financials. Burke Lev's bring, bring something unique to this literature, advice based on solid empirical research from diverse fields, often augmented by Burke Lev himself, served up in clear, engaging prose, an instant classic. Well, that's my opinion. Uh, but also, uh, as book review editor, I, of course, was not going to review Brooks' book on my own. That would have been uh, totally in violation of propriety. But I did ask uh, our, one of our senior financial writers, a very independent-minded reporter, uh, to uh, skewer Brooks' book if he cared to do so, to indict it for its inadequacies if he cared to do so. A couple of key passages from the review by Michael Santoli, who is one of our best known financial journalists. He wrote about Brooks' book. It offers valuable counsel on how to manage investors' expectations and reactions through policies of forthrightness. And from an investor's standpoint, it provides a valuable window on how such policies should be pursued. The author is not some shoot from the hip management consultant hoping to promote his advisory bu business. His book is a serious survey of recent academic literature, all synthesized into a set of digestible principles for corporate managers seeking to cultivate healthy and mutually beneficial relations with investors and analysts. The author, while unlikely to dethrone Bob Newhart as the world's funniest accountant, <laughs> does sprinkle his sometimes wonkish text with real wit. Well, you'll uh, read about the wit in his book. You might hear some wit uh, as we proceed. But meanwhile, we want to focus on the insights. Uh, Baruch, I want to begin by asking you a general question. Your subtitle includes the words, surprising truths to boost your stock price, to boost your stock price. Who is that you in that your, and what are some of those surprising truths? So who are they? You'll remember Paul Newman asking this question again and again in the Sundance Kid. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Who are these guys? Who, who are, are these guys? Are these guys? Uh, <laughs> they were chased by a posse. <laughs> you see where I get all my education from. <laughs> So uh, who are the you? The you are corporate managers. So CEOs, CFOs, you, investor relations, uh, board members, very important. Uh, so that's a book for managers. 
And uh, I recount in the book a lunch I had many years ago with the CEO of a very, very large pharmaceutical company. And he opened the lunch by saying that uh, he really hit it, he said, on the nail. He talked about uh, an old paper of mine. And he said, for us CEOs, uh, capital markets are the most important. And apparently he saw a puzzled look on my face coming from uh, a firm that uh, spends like seven, eight billion dollars on R&D a year. Capital market, the most important thing. He said, I'll prove it to you. He said, uh, look, at, look at conference calls. They are invariably led by the CEO and the CFO, and of course, investor relations. He said, we delegate everything. We delegate R&D and marketing and production, everything. There is one thing a CEO will never delegate, and that's talking to investors. So that's, that's how important uh, uh, this is. So I said, well, I'm convinced. Uh, so that's about, that's, as I said, the book uh, uh, for uh, uh, managers. And uh, so capital markets were always important uh, for managers. I think they are more important now than ever in recent history uh, because managers are facing a hostile, resentful <laughs> group of, of uh, investors uh, these days. Uh, these are investors that endured uh, the most horrendous stock market uh, decade uh, since the uh, depression. Uh, they saw a parade of accounting scandals uh, starting with Enron and, and WorldCom and continuing with all the uh, companies during the financial crisis that uh, went bust. Uh, they saw almost, they are seeing almost an endless array of uh, uh, managerial compensation excesses, abuses, stock options, uh, manipulations, and they are really very uh, resentful. And they are not taking it uh, lying down. And the things that they are doing are very, very harmful. That's why a response is required. First of all, they desert equities in droves. The statistics on, on withdrawal of funds from uh, stock Stock funds are, are, are really alarming. I mean, b most of the increases in stock prices seen recently were, came on very light trade. Uh, not, not only this, they lobby and get very restrictive regulations. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, Say on Pay, uh, enhancing, enhancing protections for whistleblowers, everything that constrains uh, managers. People start to realize now the economists, sorry I mentioned the economists, but the economists said just a month ago an interesting article, the shackled boss. Corporate bosses are much less powerful than they used to be. So we are talking about, about things that are really very, very important. And this uh, e uh, uh, investors' activism, as you well know, is at all-time high. Uh, hedge funds, intrusion into company, this requires a response. And I think I, provide, I chart such a response in the book. Manager's response to resentful shareholders. Now, and you ask me about... Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. You asked me about surprises. surprises. Uh, I think there are, there are uh, uh, lots of surprises uh, in the book. Give you a few examples. Uh, one of them, the, the dreaded miss of the consensus earnings. Uh, a nightmare for managers. Uh, turns out that it's, it's far from the end of the world. Most, most misses of the consensus uh, if the fundamentals are relatively intact, are a non-event. At most, there will be a hit to the stock price of 2-3% for a few days. Stock will come back. I provide lots of examples uh, of this. So this, this is not as everyone thinks or dreads uh, about. But of course, it requires the right 
uh, spawn the right reaction from uh, uh, managers. So if you miss the consensus, you don't just miss the consensus. You have to provide a warning as early as possible. You then have to provide a credible explanation for missing the uh, consensus. You come up with a, a plan, a remedial plan, and then uh, trace the plan. So that's, that's one surprise. Uh, I, I think another su surprise is uh, another nightmare of managers, shareholder litigation. Now, I have a, I have a chart in my book that comes from uh, NERA about annual, annual filing of shareholder uh, litigation, which actually there are no more than 200, 210 a year on average. So they are relatively very few. And even those came down, decreased continuously from 2001 to, to something like 121 a year. Uh, last two years there was a, a, a blip because of the financial crisis, uh, several uh, lawsuits against the financial institutions, and about 50, 60 lawsuits against, uh, against Chinese companies. But these are, I think, temporary events. Uh, what really goes on, and most people don't realize it, and some people call it a tectonic change, is that the importance of shareholder lawsuit decreased significantly in recent years. So the private enforcement through shareholder lawsuits of securities law decreases significantly. And what increases are SEC actions, Department of Justice actions. So there is a very significant shift from private enforcement to public enforcement with, I, I think, very important implications for uh, investor relations people and the lawyers that keep you gagged and managers uh, gagged. The scare of shareholder lawsuit is, is uh, decreasing. Uh, another surprise, I think, is uh, managerial compensation. Uh, th there is clearly a, a widespread resentment by investors and the public in, a, at large against uh, uh, managerial compensation. And uh, CEOs that I talked with basically poo-pooed this, and they said, you know, that's, that's due to ignorance, due to envy, and, and things like that. This is not the case. There is a serious reason, fundamental reason for shareholder, for, for the uh, resentment. If I can see the first one. Uh, this is a very, a very simple way of showing it. What I did here is I took the 500 S&P 500 companies, average over 2003, 2008, on the vertical axis performance of the company in terms of return on asset. You get the same thing if you do it return on equity. And here the compensation of the CEO in millions of dollars. And you would expect that if there is a strong correlation, a strong link between compensation and performance, most of these 500 dots will be along an upward sloping line. The higher the performance, the higher the, uh, the compensation. That's what, not what you see here. What you see here is basically a correlation of zero. And I'm doing empirical research like 35 years. I've re <laughs> rarely seen a correlation of zero. <laughs> I asked the person who did it for me to go back and check and recheck it, and then I gave it to a colleague who I have complete confidence in his empirical ability. All of them came back. This is the problem, and it's a very serious problem. Uh, uh, pay for no performance. I don't, say, I don't say in all companies, there are many companies in which they definitely pay for performance, but the tails here and the tails here, high compensation, low performance, are, are very, very fat. Uh, another surprise quickly is that hedge funds that intervene in companies and try to get their people on the board and all of this you're, you're familiar with, uh, usually are considered by managers as nuisance, uh, waste of time. In fact, they create lots of shareholder value. If I can see the second one, this comes from a study of, of almost 400 uh, uh, interventions, intrusions of hedge funds into uh, public companies. 
And what you see here is the stock price increase around the filing of 13D. That's, that's the form with the SEC that uh, announces a position of 5% or, or more. This is usually the start of hedge funds calling on companies for a, cha a change. They create lots of value, lots of value, so they should be taken uh, uh, seriously. And the last that I would mention here to save time is that I think that guidance is a good thing. And I even wrote about it in the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, last year. But it, again, it has to be done smartly, and not all firms have uh, uh, to guide. But those that uh, should and can, it brings lots of good things. Could you uh, go over that chart just for a moment for my satisfaction? It's demonstrating what? Uh, that chart, what, what this uh, uh, here, yeah. this is uh, days before this filing. So again, the filing is of, as I mentioned, the Form 13D. If, you, if, if your investment in the public company gets to the 5% or more than 5%, you have to file with the SEC, uh, announcing publicly uh, this investment and, and uh, saying uh, what, what are your intentions. Are you going to be a passive investor or an active investor? And if, if an active investor then what? Uh, changing the board, changing the strategy of the company, calling for a larger distribution. So what you have here, you have volume of shares around the announcement a couple of days before, a couple of days uh, after. So we see a huge increase in volume of uh, shares. Shareholders pay attention. But what's more important, this is the average stock price, average change in the stock price uh, around the announcement. The announcement is, is about, uh, about here. So there is a very significant increase, and it's not a blip that goes down, it continues, which basically reflects that uh, the fact that investors expect a lot from the intervention of hedge funds in companies, expect mm. a change, and a change for the better. Why, why do you think, going back to the uh, problem of uh, CEO pay, versus performance, the zero correlation, uh, why uh, do you think that is the case? What, what are some of the factors that have caused that to happen? Uh, in many cases, very weak boards. Very weak boards that uh, basically yield to the CEOs. And again, I say in, in many cases, not in all cases. There are companies with very strong boards and, and good boards and very hardworking uh, uh, managers, many of them. Uh, weak boards, uh, in most cases, compensation uh, is, is assisted, is determined by compensation consultants. They benchmark your company against others, and you always have to be slightly better than the others, slightly better than above the average. It's like the, the, the kids in the, in the Wobbegon, you know, killers think that, you know, all of them, he ends the program by saying, uh, all the women are beautiful and the men are strong, and all the, all the children are above average. So when, you, when everyone has to be above average, it creeps up and up and up. And lots of components of the compensation are not tied to serious benchmark. A serious benchmark is your performance should be above the median or the average of peers. Not just a positive earnings, which is very easy to get, or even increase in earnings or sales, which is very easy to get uh, by mergers and acquisition, even, even, even if the acquisition is terrible in terms of overpayment, uh, the mere fact that you combine two entities, sales are going to increase for a while and earnings are going to increase for a while, a while and then this boosts significantly uh, compensation. Mm -hmm. But these are not serious targets. So you think that it would be possible to devise a measure whereby uh, CEO performance could be quantified and according to which CEO pay could be determined. Yes. You think it's quite doable Definitely. and that companies should implement that? Yes. I see. Yes. But it should not be stock options, should not be tied no. to No, no, no. Yeah. no. 
Yeah. Because stock options, first of all, it's to some extent unfair to managers. I mean, I'm, I'm not against managers. I don't have a vendetta against managers. Uh, I, I think that, that, that uh, the, the incredible economic performance of uh, this country for many, many years is mainly because of, uh, because of uh, managers. There are, there are a few aspects that I have uh, problems uh, uh, with. But uh, I also want to be fair to managers. Stock perform the, the, the stock performance is not controlled by uh, managers. It has all kinds of elements go into, uh, into the stock price. Mm. And I have a table showing, uh, showing uh, in my book showing that uh, stock performance has very low re uh, uh, relations, very weak link with the talents, with the capabilities of, uh, of uh, managers. So uh, I think that stock performance should be one relatively small component of the compensation. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. should be mainly based on, on uh, financial numbers, but hard, strong financial numbers. Uh, for example, uh, increase in sales, as I indicated before, is very easy to get. Uh, so organic sales increase, which some, some analysts are, are using, meaning taking out recent acquisitions, that's a much harder measure. Uh, uh, and, and there are many, many other me uh, hard measures too. For example, non-financial measures. I think about telecommunication companies, uh, uh, internet-based uh, companies, uh, I increased number of uh, customers. Mm -hmm. Customers churn, how many are leaving you? Uh, uh, the percentage of those that are leaving you. Th these, are, these can, first of all, very hard to manipulate because these are facts and uh, these are really hard, hard measures. Mm -hmm. Brooke, you uh, believe, as you've written, that more information is good. Uh, can investors ever suffer from information overload? Uh, how much information is good? First of all, they suffer already from information overload. And uh, Herbert Simon got an, uh, uh, a Nobel Prize, as you well know, on the concept of constrained capacity. He was really the first among economists that uh, recognized that uh, decision makers, he didn't speak just about investors, but decision makers have very constrained capacity to, to deal with information. So he, he used to say that uh, these days, the scarce resource is not information. The scarce resource is the capacity to uh, process, to digest, uh, to use this uh, information. This was then used by uh, behavioral scientists and they gave it the name of uh, limited attention. Uh, I mean, you don't need a theory for this. It's just common sense that when you are flooded with information, <laughs> you have limited attention. Uh, just think about, about analysts. They have to cover 10, 15, sometimes 20 stocks with quarterly reports and annual reports and, and lots of filings with the SEC and industry analysis, things like that. How much attention can they give uh, to, uh, to individual companies and, uh, and or, or uh, events? So we have, we have this flood. There are two beautiful examples of uh, limited attention which I also discussed. One is a study by two uh, Columbia professors. I hate to speak about our competitors, but <laughs> they are from Columbia. And they, they analyzed one case, and that's a front page article in 1998 in the New York Times about a biotech company, Entremed, and about a, a revolutionary cancer drug that they are uh, developing or developed already. Uh, on the day that the article appeared, stock price of Entremed uh, went up from 12 to 52 in one day. And the, what, what these two researchers are doing in the article is they are showing that there was absolutely zero information in the New York Times article 
all the information in the article was published before in scientific journals, but much of it in the New York, by the New York Times itself, but not on the front page. So for limited attention investors, if you have something on the front page with zero new information, it is new information just by, <laughs> by being there. Uh, second example is uh, things that you are familiar with, performer earnings. Now the SEC requires that performer earnings should not be exhibited more prominently than gap earnings. But until a few years ago, some companies in the earnings release would have performer earnings in the title, and then small letters, they would have gap earnings. And uh, a study showed, really an interesting study, that when the performer earnings are in the title, they have a substantially larger effect on stock prices than when the same information is in the body of, of uh, the news. It's amazing. Now, so there is, a, there is an overload, but, but this really opens a wide door for investor relations to design, to craft a communication to uh, limited attention investors. And i just give you a couple of uh, examples. Uh, studies have shown that uh, people have limited attention investors have great difficulty processing soft information narrative, uh, much easier for them uh, to process hard information, numbers. Uh, if you look at conference calls, for example, studies have shown that now with computers you can do uh, anything, that conference calls where the ratio of numbers to words is larger, have much larger effect on the stock price and the volume of trend than when this ratio is lower. So the, the blah, blah, <laughs> I don't want to say bullshit, <laughs> uh, ba basically models, models the message. So focus on hard information. And again, hard information is not just numbers. These have to be numbers that ha have two attributes to them. One is that, uh, that they are comparable, like sales. When you see sales of one company, you can compare it with sales of another company because you know that the accounting recognition rules of sales are uniform, and they have to be verifiable. If you give numbers that investors can later on verify, uh, they are much harder. They are taken more seriously. So for example, an earnings guidance is verifiable because after a few weeks, after a few months, you can compare it with, uh, with the facts. So working on hard hardening, and I talk about in the book, hardening soft information uh, will craft the message to limited uh, attention investors. Uh, another thing is uh, media mentioning. It's very important, as, as you all know, to get to get mentioning uh, in the media. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do, but if you, if you cultivate reporters <coughs> and uh, when they call and they ask to speak uh, with managers, they don't get a no. And if they get an interesting story, not just bullshit again, they will come again and you can feed information to them. This is, as the New York Times uh, story that I gave before, this, this is uh, almost a sure recipe for getting attention of uh, investors. Let me uh, contribute a point uh, there uh, myself <laughs> since uh, Baruch mentions uh, the media. Uh, Barron's uh, claims uh, readership of nearly a million. We have circulation of about half a million for print and, uh, and, uh, and online and uh, we claim two readers per subscription. Uh, probably about right. Uh, and of course, it's read by the investment community, uh, a four million net worth uh, average reader uh, is what our readers uh, can command in terms of resources. So we're clearly a good outlet. I, I polled our, uh, some of our, my fellow reporters uh, who do company stories. Company stories at Barron's are the most read feature that we publish, a company story uh, it has to be in almost every Barron's uh, by assignment from the editor. I don't do company stories. I'm on the shelf doing other stuff. 
but the company stories are the, are the popular feature. And uh, the question for any company story is, can you make a case that this company uh, will rise in value by 20% over the next year or will fall in value by 20% over the next year? Uh, that second one, you're probably not too interested in selling, but if you can call uh, <laughs> Barron's reporter and say, I have a case to make before you for a company story that you can do for Barron's uh, that uh, this uh, company uh, that I'm representing is undervalued and could rise in value by 20% over the next year, you'll get a hearing. Uh, I suggest what you do is email them first. The, uh, the key to getting in touch with Barron's people is uh, our names are always in full. My name, Gene Epstein, is gene.epstein at barrons.com. So any of the, like Vito Racanelli is vito.racanelli at barrons.com. Just look at the masthead, read Barron's, look at the company stories, and then you can make a case. And those company stories are, again, very widely read, very popular among Barron's readers. Uh, and uh, so you might want to follow up on that. Uh, back to Baruch. Uh, you say, uh, you mentioned numbers, which intrigues me. You say that investors have a long-term perspective rather than a short-term. Now, in the short-term, you look at numbers. Uh, in the long-term, you look at other things, I guess. Uh, but uh, your claim is rather surprising that, they're in, that they have a long-term perspective rather than short-term. What evidence is there to support that claim? Uh, first of all, I don't deny that there are investors that have very short-term horizon. One of them is my daughter, <laughs> who, <laughs> who worked for several years for a hedge fund, and uh, she's a, a biotech uh, graduate, biochemistry graduate from, uh, from Berkeley, so she followed uh, biotech companies. And uh, her, her task was to predict the earnings of the companies just a few weeks before they uh, came out. So she would talk with doctors. She would talk, uh, she would get information about, from, about uh, sales of drugs. And from this outside information, she would make a prediction. Uh, but they all traded just a few weeks. Very stressful job. She would, from time to time, call me after an earnings release, said I lost them $20 million. <laughs> but uh, in some cases, she made money. So, so there, are, there are, of course, short-term uh, investors. And by the way, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Not ethically, not legally. As a matter of fact, there is lots of good in short-term investors because they provide liquidity to the market. If everyone was a long-term investors, who would you buy shares from in this case? But what I claim is that the markets are dominated by uh, long-term investors. And in a moment, I'll talk about, about the evidence, uh, but I want to say that this is an extremely important issue because most managers believe that investors are myopic and they, they have to adjust their policies, their strategies to myopic investors. Uh, this is the main reason for information manipulation. Because if you believe that uh, investors are focused only on the next quarter's uh, earnings, you will do anything to meet the consensus or to uh, show an increase in earnings. And if this doesn't come from the business, it comes from uh, accounting manipulation. Uh, this is also a major reason for uh, managers cutting uh, long-term investment, the belief in myopic investors, cutting long-term investors, investments like R&D. Uh, Baron said uh, two beautiful articles, many beautiful, but two that I'll quote here about R&D, one several years ago about 3M, in which they talked about the, the CEO, Jim McNeilney, who is now in, in Boeing. And the article was positive in general, but uh, the focus was on R&D. And he was slowing down substantially the rise in, the rise in uh, R&D. And the uh, result was that uh, during his duration as, as CEO, the stock went nowhere. And recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, you had an article about Hewlett Packard and all the problems. And again, focus on, on uh, R&D. And it's just incredible to think that R&D now at Hewlett Packard is less than, 
uh, is less than th uh, 3%, like I think 2.6, 2.7%, and they have competitors there with R&D more than 6% relative, relative to sales. So you have, you have case of managers that are, are basically clearly sacrificing the future just to, to, make, uh, to make the numbers. Uh, so uh, clearing this issue of the myopic investors is a very important uh, thing. And let me say a few words about, about uh, the evidence. Uh, one thing which I find very compelling is, is the following, if I can have the next one. Uh, what you have here is again a tectonic change uh, in the U.S. economy. And you have uh, investment in uh, tangible assets, fixed assets, inventory, and investment in intangible assets, which is R&D, brands, human resources, software, uh, of course, and what you see is a, a, an incredible uh, change, investment in tangible assets, which reached in the 80s, like 14% of business output continuously goes down to about 10%, and investment in intangible asset goes uninterruptedly up, uh, surpassed investment in tangible assets, uh, in, in the 90s, and the, and the gap between the two is growing. Now, why do I show you this? Because this investment in intangible asset, uh, which was estimated at more than a trillion, with a T, trillion dollars a year, we are talking about huge, huge numbers, is, from an accounting point of view, is immediately expensed. Okay? R&D software, brands, advertisement, immediately expense, which means it hits current earnings for an uncertain promise that you'll get something in the future. Now, I wanted to think if myopic investors would tolerate such a thing in the long term. Would they tolerate their companies spending a trillion dollar a year which hits current earnings, which supposedly is all that they are concerned about and does a lot of good uh, in, in uh, the long term. So for me, this is almost uh, sufficient evidence, but that's, of course, not all. There is a beautiful study which I describe in the book by three uh, consultants, and that's, the long, that's a, a large-scale study on, on thousands of uh, companies. And they, they do the following thing. It's a very interesting exercise. They look at revisions in analyst forecasts, short-term revisions, next quarter, next year, and long-term revisions, five years. And as you know, when analysts revise the forecast, uh, investors react to this, and their stock price changes. So then they use statistical uh, uh, techniques, econometric uh, studies, to examine uh, which of the two, revisions of short-term forecasts or revisions of long-term forecasts, has a large effect on the stock price, meaning has a large effect on investors. And I want to read you the, the conclusion of, of uh, this study. They say, this research is consistent. I mean, what they find, I didn't say it, what they find is that what really has an effect on investors' decisions are almost only the revisions in long-term forecast, much more than the revisions in short-term forecast. And that's how they conclude. They say the research is consistent with an interpretation that shareholder returns, price changes, uh, in the current year are primarily related to expectations about long-term performance. These are not myopic investors. Uh, our results run counter to the conventional wisdom that all, the, all that the market cares about is that the company hits or exceeds its quarterly earnings target and suggests that share prices respond to changes in short-term earnings only in so far that they are signals of long-term uh, earnings. Uh, there are other studies uh, like this. I have a, a study, I took a different uh, approach to this, and I 
and again, you can do it with econometrics on large samples, I measured the proportion of, of share price in, in, in many industries that is related to the short term. And the short term, I define the short term as, or short term concerns of shareholders as the assets of the company. This is clearly short term, this is available. And this year and next year's forecast of earnings. And then the long term. So I determine the proportion of price that relates to this short term and relates to the long term. And if I can have the, la the next one, uh, here I have for, for uh, lots of very important industries, oil and gas and measuring uh, control equipment, uh, medical equipment, computers, utilities, banking, and so on and so on. This is the average for the industry, the proportion of share price that reflect long-term growth. And as you see in some industries, it's 70% and 64%. In most industries, it's about 50%. So uh, on average, more than half the price of the stock reflects uh, uh, the long term. And I, I just end up, I don't want to take too much time, end up with one study which I call the clincher, because it is the most obvious. Uh, this study compared the performance profitability, long-term, of private companies with public companies. Now, private companies are not uh, under the, the, the pressure of the myopic investors, okay? They don't report quarterly, and they don't, they don't even have investors, so of course they don't care about investors. So you would think if indeed short-term investors affect managerial decisions sacrificing future growth, then private companies should do, should perform much better than public companies. This is a study that I quote in the book, so you can, you can have a look at uh, the study. The result is that the performance of public companies, those that are, are presumably under the pressure of myopic investors, is double the performance of private companies. On average, double the performance of private companies. I just end up by saying, you know, uh, for, for me, uh, it was very interesting to understand why people have this obsession with, with the myopic investor. Because I could trace it back to the 70s uh, when there was a, a, a huge dip in productivity in the United States. And uh, th at that time, Japan was rising, uh, and Germany was rising, and people, including even Peter Drucker, I remember, uh, uh, talked in the same terms that people talk today about China. The United States is doomed, and it's going to lose its, uh, I never believed in this, I don't believe it now. But, uh, I, I, but then people looked for a scapegoat, and the scapegoat was the market. Myopic investors, which then force managers to be myopic and to sacrifice the future, not to invest in the long term. But then there were huge increases in productivities in the 80s, in the 90s, in the, in the 2000s even. And I thought that somehow this belief in myopic investors would fade away, but it never goes away. Never goes away. Always comes back again and again. And I think the reason is that if you superficially look at the market, there is no doubt that investors are concerned with quarterly earnings and that managers are concerned with satisfying investors' concern. So if you look at it, you say, what can, can explain this thing? It must be that they are myopic, both investors and managers. And they are not. Now, I want to give you an example uh, from NASA. So here NASA sends the rover to the Mars, which is clearly a long-term project. Okay, it takes months to get there and then months for the rover to, to rove and <laughs> around and, and send information. But if you look at, Na and you all saw it, if you look at NASA control engineers, we see it on, te on television, they are glued to their computer screens uh, uh, tracing, tracing the progress of, of the rover second by second. 
So someone, someone just looking at it would say that these are short-termers. So all they are concerned <laughs> is about the second-by-second second, uh, uh, progress of, of uh, the mission, which of course is idiotic. They are concerned about the long term, but what is the long term? The long term is a succession of short terms. How do you get to the long term <laughs> without going short term by short term by short term? And that's, that's uh, I think, that's what investors are doing. And I just end up by saying that good managers, really good managers understand this. And while they create growth in the long term, they never lose the sight of the short term. And I have, the, uh, have in the book two graphs of two remarkable turnaround uh, stories, one by, by uh, Lou Gerstner, a very famous uh, turnaround of IBM. When he took IBM in uh, 1993, IBM was almost done for, done for missed every technological development that you can think of. He turned around IBM uh, within a couple of years. That made, made it the giant, again, the giant that uh, they are now quadrupling the, the stock price. But if you look at the performance during the 90s under, under Lou Gerstner, and I have, uh, as I said before, I have a graph on this, he didn't miss a single quarterly consensus. Okay, so quarter by quarter by quarter and the long term. And the second story is about someone who, who is much less known than Lou Gerstner, that's Bob Lane, who is the CEO of uh, John Deere uh, and company, who took uh, Deere in 2002. Uh, Deere lagged all its competitors, terrible performance. He made it number one, tripled the stock price, and again, when you look at the performance of Deere, of Deere definitely creating a, a long term, not missing a single quarter of, of the consensus. These are good managers. Well, I want to throw it open for questions. Uh, and uh, I think I already see a question. I myself occasionally cheat when I'm in the audience. I'm about to ask a question. Cheat for about 60 seconds. Give us a 60 second speech if you must, but then maybe get to the question. And uh, I see a question right over there. Yeah. Uh, to, to that point yeah. you just made about, uh, oh, sure. Thank you. Just to the point you just made about Gerstner and, uh, and John Deere's CEO, was it uh, performance of the company or the way they managed expectations that allowed them to beat consensus? And how, how does the managing of expectations really, uh, you know, how critical is that, of course? It's, it's critical, but uh, you cannot manage expectations for a long time without, without providing performance. I mean, it can be, can be a short while, tell stories as some new CEOs are, are doing, you know, uh, talk about uh, the great strategy that uh, uh, you are now uh, trying to embark on, but you, uh, you quickly have to show performance. I mean, and, another and example is Jack Welch at, at GE, but half of their earnings were coming from a, a black box at GE Capital. Yeah. When that yeah. went away, yeah. all of a sudden they started missing estimates. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, GE, uh, well, this is recorded, so I won't, <laughs> I'm not going to say what I wanted to say. <laughs> but I, I, remember, I remember a front page article in the Wall Street Journal in the 90s about GE, how they manage their accounting and this and that, so I have to say, you know. Let the record show that Brooke Lev did not want to say what he wanted to say about <laughs> GE. I'll see if I can drag it out of him afterwards. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, over here. Yeah. Hi, Professor. If I could ask yeah. two questions. Um, one, with respect to something you said early about um, management pre-announcing if they know they're going to miss consensus. So my question there is, obviously, if you give guidance and you're going to miss your guidance, you pre-announce. But I've always known and been taught you don't pre-announce against consensus because you're offering a tacit uh, level of credence to uh, consensus, which it may not necessarily deserve because analysts, while many of them are very good, their models are often flawed. So my questions around that were, you know, 
do you have any parameters around that? And do you first take into account, you know, how much you actually believe in the consensus? And then my second question was, the title of your book, granted this may be a stretch, may imply that stock price is one way to measure the efficacy of your IR or communications program. Whether or not you meant that, how would you, how would you counsel management, your, my CFO, how should uh, he or she measure an IR program? Uh, second one is tough. Uh, what, what, I, what I mentioned before when I said about warning, I meant warning, not just any, uh, any, any guidance. So when you're, you know you're going to disappoint investors, two, three weeks, four weeks before the end of the quarter, the results are almost uh, known, and uh, you know you're going to disappoint. Uh, some managers, uh, maybe even many managers, don't resist the temptation and start manipulating. And we know that manipulation is, is on a very large scale because if you look at what's, what's called the earnings surprise, meaning the difference between reported earnings and the most recent consensus before reported earnings, for a large sample like thousands of companies over, over many years, you would expect it to be some kind of a bell shape, uh, those who miss the consensus, those who beat the consensus, about, about the same. Now, those who meet the consensus and beat it by one, two, three percent are 65 percent of the sample. Can you imagine? 65 percent of the sample are doing this. It's impossible to do without manipulation. <laughs> impossible to guide such a huge ship, like a, a large company, to beat the consensus by one penny. I mean, it's, 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 it's kindergarten stuff that this is, cannot be done. So. Rather than doing this, what I said is miss the consensus and uh, uh, nothing much will happen if you won't provide a credible plan and uh, 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 so on and so on. Uh, the only case in which stocks are really hit when they miss the consensus even by a penny is if there was a huge stock price increase before that meaning this became a growth story, a dream company, and all of a sudden, this dream is shattered by a miss of the consensus. I mean, investors, particularly the momentum investors, they are bailing out, and uh, then you will get a huge hit, which is relate, relates to one of the issues that I talk in the book about overpriced shares, which is a calamity uh, to come. Uh, so this is, this is about the consensus. If you know you're going to miss the consensus, my, as I said, my, my prescription is miss it without, without the manipulation because when you start with the manipulation, uh, no one knows where it goes. You remember the Satyam uh, case, the Indian, large Indian IT uh, company that the founder and CEO wrote in 2009 a letter to the board basically telling them that I manipulated everything. Everything, assets, liabilities, earnings, everything. But then he writes, he writes, and I find it very, very insightful, he writes what, what started as a very small gap, and managers are always convinced that this is a very small gap, just you know, two cents, two pennies per share, that's all they need. And next quarter, they will cover it. He says what started as a small gap increased and increased, and I found myself riding a tiger that I couldn't dismount without being eaten <laughs> by, by uh, the tiger. So that's, that's the huge danger of, of uh, manipulation. They just become worse and worse. How would you, how would you measure how would you measure IR performance uh, if uh, uh, there are smart measures? I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at the stock price. Absolutely not. I mean, uh, I said before that CEOs don't control share prices. Uh, investor relations people definitely don't control uh, uh, share price. I would look, for example, I don't want to take too much time, I would look at, at the effectiveness of conference calls. 
which attest to the IR and also attest, of course, to the uh, communication. And there are beautiful measures, uh, beautiful measures that tell you about effectiveness of conference calls. Uh, all of them are used by researchers, but uh, they are easy to get. One of them, look, look at the increase in volume of shares, which indicates the activity. Uh, two, three, four hours uh, from the conference call. Okay, I just have I just have data here, which uh, I want to give you as an example. I collected <laughs> for UPS and FedEx and Jing He, which is a PhD student. She did it for me, and the buzz. I call it I call it a buzz because if the conference call really provides new valuable information, you will see a large increase in volume. If the conference call is a bore. Like, like most, most lawyers want it to be. I mean, not, don't tell anything, you know. And, 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 and one CEO was overheard. He didn't, didn't realize that the mic is still on, saying, thank God it's over <laughs> by the end of the conference call. But the, 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 the increase in volume of FedEx is substantially higher than the increase of volume of, uh, of uh, UPS uh, in this case. And there are good explanations to this. I mentioned before the, the, num the, share, the ratio of numbers to blah, blah is uh, substantially higher for FedEx than UPS. Uh, FedEx conference calls, uh, eight persons are answering questions. CEO, CFO, investor relations, and division managers for UPS only two in this case, so you get much more. So these are, these are the things that I, I will look at. What do you say? I haven't been on UBS as a I know, that's why I took it as an example. <laughs> <laughs> but I just joined the era this morning. Yeah. This is uh, two years ago. <laughs> just, just before you joined. <laughs> just before you joined. So these are, these are the measures that I, I will use, not a superficial measure, easy measure like share price. I think this gentleman has a question. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Earlier you, you uh, defined long term. Earlier, you defined long-term as, I think, five years or five years plus. I'm curious as to what you're using as a proxy for those long-run expectations. I know that a lot of people publish uh, five-year earnings Kagers, which are generally uh, excessively inflated. Um, not a lot of um, individual annual numbers out there beyond two or three years. So what was, how, how did you measure those expectations? I, this is not a study that I did. This is a study that others did, and I, I uh, described and uh, quoted. Uh, they, they took, as I said, the short term, they took uh, next quarter, next year. And long term, our uh, analyst, analyst growth forecast three to five years. That's what they took. I know that they are not perfect and uh, they, they may be biased, but uh, these, these were the data that they used for I short and long term. I can certainly tell you that if you call a Barron's reporter and you have a narrative, a vision, uh, that uh, your company can put forward, the reporter will love it. You know, because we feel readers love to read about visions, about uh, business plans, about ideas for the future that can sell, that are, that are basically long-term uh, ideas uh, that I think excite shareholders' imagination. Uh, that's my view. Uh, another question from this side? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, lady in the back. I'm curious uh, as to whether you looked at the correlation between hedge fund investment 13D filing, or if it wasn't your study, the individual the individuals did, a correlation between that 13D filing and the company's performance thereafter. Because I believe that what we're just seeing is the stock price performance. Yeah. And I'm curious as to whether there's just a follow the crowd mentality who follows the names in hedge funds, you know, as sort of part of that limited attention investor, or mm -hmm. whether the company's performance yeah. also improves. Yeah. People try to do it, but uh, you know, research, is particularly in social sciences like what we do, is, is always limited. Uh, it's very difficult to separate the effect of the hedge fund from managers because uh, companies that are attacked by hedge funds, uh, and that's what uh, the studies show, 
are usually undervalued companies. Stock-wise are undervalued. Uh, these are prob many of them are problematic companies. So even without the hedge fund, managers are trying to do whatever they can do to, to revive the, uh, the price. And uh, so to separate what, what was the effect of the hedge fund and from the effect of management trying to reorganize and get is very difficult to do. What the studies could do, and this is telling by itself, is to what extent the demand of hedge funds are being met. So changes in the board, changes in strategy, like uh, closing divisions, things like this, uh, larger distribution of uh, money, uh, and extreme cases, even firing the, the CEO. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement <coughs> of hedge funds. Uh, for example, changes in boards they get in more than 70% of the cases. Sometimes it requires lots of effort, proxy, uh, contest, but in more than 70% of the cases, they get uh, changes in uh, board. Changes in strategy are more difficult. The easiest is to get the company to, uh, to increase dividends or stock uh, buyback. Uh, companies will do it immediately just to get rid of the, of the hedge fund. Uh, but, but in this, they have clearly achievements. But to what extent they are responsible, there is an improvement in these companies, clearly, but to what extent they are responsible or just the threat of the hedge funds or it would have come even without the hedge fund, uh, very difficult to know. But a more upbeat note, final question that I want to put to Baruch is, uh, what can investor relate I also want a seat of the table here in this business school. This is natural. Uh, what I know is that, that formal changes in the hierarchy, like uh, making the, C the IR person reporting directly to the CEO, is not going to work. You need substance, not form. Even if you sit by the table already and you don't have a compelling, actionable message, then you will just sit by the table. Okay, so the trick is to have a compelling message. And if you'll have a compelling message, actionable message, they will invite you and the board will invite you. And how do you get a compelling <coughs> message if, if I may be allowed to, to give you advice? Is uh, first of all, identify the concerns. Uh, I mentioned my daughter, I'll also mention my son-in-law uh, he's a marketing executive at uh, EMC. And uh, when I talk with him about marketing issues, he from time to time quotes, he says, you, se you sell into pain. Okay, you don't just sell. People buy in most cases because there is a pain and they need to buy it. So identify the pain. So what, what is the pain of the board? What is the pain of uh, managers? Is it a lagging stock price? Is it overactive uh, uh, investors? Uh, 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 is, it, is it short sellers that defame the, the company? What is the main concern or what are the main concerns? Once you identify, and I'm sure you know what are the main concerns, not difficult to identify. Once you identify it, do semi-research. Come up, come up with, first of all, a documentation. And I, I will call it the, the annual communication checkup. Like the checkup that you get from your doctor. Okay, blood work and all the rest. Start with, start with the symptoms, comparing to benchmark, other companies in, in the industry. Uh, again, in the I looked at uh, I looked at UPS, and that's again before you join. Uh, U, UPS, UPS and FedEx. You're not in the UPS. UPS. Oh no 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 UPS, UPS. You United Parcel Service, the brown people. I mean, there's no comparison between UBS and FedEx. UPS, 
So I, I looked at uh, what comes out in research as the most reliable measure of uncertainty of investors, and that's the dispersion of the consensus. Dispersions of analyst forecast around the consensus. So in some cases, the forecast of the 15, let's say 20 analysts <coughs> that follow the company are very close to the consensus, low dispersion, other cases very far from the consensus. Very far from the consensus, large dispersion clearly indicates that investors are very uncertain about the company. And this is a readily available measure. Yahoo Finance will give you uh, uh, the dispersion. And uh, when I look at the dispersion, FedEx had this has dispersion of 7.9% uh, against UPS, 29.5%, four times higher. Okay? So in my annual checkup, I have several symptoms, like high cholesterol and... Uh, hypertension, things like that. And then that's how you built up the case, to have a message. And then you talk about the reasons for, uh, for these things. Okay, and I mentioned a few reasons before, ineffective conference calls and uh, 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 guidance. FedEx guides both annually and quarterly. UPS guides only annually in this case. So there are very good reasons. So it's relatively easy to come up with something that will capture the attention of managers. That's how you get a seat at, at the table. And then you come up with a plan. Like your doctor, after the checkup, if he's a good one, he or she, I mean, they, they will tell you what should be done, how, how, to, how to correct the, the situation. This, this is, uh, I think, the only way in which you can really get a seat at the table. Tell them something that they don't know, something important, something actionable. They will listen to you. First step in the right direction is read Brooks' book. Thank you very much, Brooks. <laughs>